Hello, welcome to my series about all Chopin's music. Today's episode uh, is a kind of exception this year uh, in 2021, because in 2021 I, uh, my goal was to make um, analysis of the pieces published during Chopin's life. But this episode is about uh, Chopin's Fantasy and Prompty in C-sharp minor, Opus 66, which was not published during Chopin's life. And, um, but many of you, uh, my dear listeners and fans, asked me um, to make such an analysis about this masterpiece. Of course, it's extremely famous and uh, loved by the audience. So here I am and I decided to um, to do it for you earlier than I planned, because otherwise I would have to postpone it until 2022, so it's quite a lot of time. So, first of all, why was it not published? This is the question. And in the website, on the website, on the website of the National Chopin Institute, we read something very interesting that the Professor Mieczysław Tomaszewski, Chopin, Chopinologist, a Polish Chopinologist, writes, and we can read, that there are two reasons, possible reasons, why this piece was not published during Chopin's life. The first assumption is that it was, it is, it was a very similar piece to already written another impromptu in E flat major, written by Ignaz Moscheles, written almost in the same year. So Chopin surely knew this piece, maybe unintentionally, maybe he didn't intend to copy this piece, but he thought it's very similar, so he didn't want to. He was only 24 years old when he wrote it, so he didn't want to be accused of copying another composer. Uh, was it his intention or not? We don't know. Maybe maybe it's just a coincidence, but these pieces are really very similar and I'm going to show it to you soon. So just you wait. And another, um, another reason um, said Arthur Rubinstein. Arthur Rubinstein, who came into the possession of one of its manuscripts. Oh, lucky him. He had a manuscript of this uh, piece. And he assumed that this work was sold to a grand lady, the Baroness d'Est, very rich lady. And probably Chopin uh, sold it for a lot of money, for her exclusively, Arthur Rubinstein says, that this work probably uh, she wanted to have it as an exclusive property and she paid a lot of money for Chopin for this that he he promised her that he will never publish it well what is the truth we don't know but certainly it's a very interesting topic about the title the title is the well the impromptu uh, was written by Auguste Franchon and this manuscript was produced during Chopin's lifetime. And the title it carries was certainly accepted by the composer. So Chopin probably called it Impromptu. And uh, later though, uh, the, the work was possibly called a fantasy as well. And this name um, was used by Fontana when he was listing Chopin's work after his death. Uh, he was listing all the Chopin works that were uh, in Chopin cupboard when Chopin wa wanted them to be fired, to be destroyed. Fontana never destroyed these pieces and he wanted to publish all of them. So he asked Chopin's sister and it was together. The idea was together, uh, made together by Chopin's sister and uh, Fontana to publish all the works and uh, in the list of works he called this uh, piece actually a, a fantasy which is very interesting so before it was impromptu then it was fantasy and now we really actually know this piece as a fantasy impromptu 
so these two titles together okay let's now let's make the music speak shall i start from moshalas yes just a little bit uh, of the Emprofi written by Ignaz Moscheles in 1834, so it's the same year when Chopin wrote his own Emprofi, this Emprofi. What is similar? Well, construction of phrases and even the melody and the accompaniment of the right hand and also the construction ABA when in the B we have slow part and the A, but the A is extremely similar, just listen. Of course the Emprofi has um, a slow introduction which starts yeah, I will not play it for you because this introduction I think is just a waste of time now in this video so you can listen to the whole piece if you want but I want to uh, show you the actual theme that starts like this listen <laughs> Once again, isn't it similar to? Yes, it is very similar. What is similar? So we have a very short phrase at the beginning. It is repeated and then it's a longer phrase and then again the same and then the, uh, and then another ending in Chopin's Fantasy Impromptu and also it's going up the same repeated and then a long phrase isn't it funny yes i think so it it looks a little bit like a copy so it's good that chopin didn't publish this piece because it could provoke some critics uh, to write some not nice words about uh, Frédéric chopin but thanks god we have this piece so thanks god it was not fired as chopin wanted because it's now favorite of audiences all over the world. Let's now do the short analysis of this masterpiece. Everything starts from one note, as we all know, and then on the left hand, which prepares the accompaniment, the background. The background, which is very, um, how to say um, speedy I mean we we have the kind of movement right it's not quiet it's not calm it is running it is definitely running but because we have the pedal we don't hear every note we hear more a kind of background of a painting and then this left hand is, is a very simple accompaniment, but, but it has a kind of melody inside. Just listen. The bass is making a melody which uh, the pianist can underline a little to make it a little bit more interesting. what we hear the background and the main theme like in Ignaz Moschalas is constructed in the very short two short phrases and then the long third phrase motifs I would say two motifs the first motif and this motif is uh, having a lot of curves right it goes up and down and then all the time up and down up and down up and down up and down so um, this this is why this is the first reason why it's not so uh, comfortable to play because the fingers are going up and down all the time uh, but on the other hand it's all written uh, for a pianist hand so this is not we don't we don't have to struggle that much i mean the concert pianist 
mm, doesn't have to struggle that much because it is all kind of comfortable to play uh, in a way I mean the, the right hand itself because together it's another story but this I will tell you uh, uh, in a second so we have the, the short phrase we have another short phrase and then we have the long phrase and then at the same phrase and then the ending okay so let's listen to it now in a much slower tempo so that we can listen it as a kind of melody to sing and it stops it is very interesting because it stops like a question it, this is like a question and the silence and then again and the silence and then a very long phrase as if some something is uh, maybe a bird is flying or maybe many birds hundreds of birds well, when I imagine Chopin playing it I'm sure he had this kind of his own uh, typical for him a uh, light touch uh, so that he hardly touched the piano and it was probably like you know something very thin uh, some net with very thin um, okay now what is so special in this piece and this is a really genius uh, of Chopin to write it like this is that um, in fact this is a very fast uh, part very fast we hear a lot of notes in the right hand but this is even faster than we uh, expect I mean then it is written because the notes of the left hand and the right hand they don't meet together so they are um, against each other so if well I don't know if it's possible but if we um, ask somebody to clap or to play this play this um, piece in the drums maybe if we play the left hand this is the left hand and the right hand is I, now I do it in a slower tempo because in a faster tempo I can't but uh, can, do you know what I want to say is that when I play it together I try now for you we have a huge amount of of the sound so Chopin is making it even faster in this way listen of notes I don't know if you, you caught it I hope you did my micro I hope my microphone worked but now I played for you without the pedal in a slower tempo so that you understand it with the notes now listen so if I play both hands in an equal dynamic then we we really can hear Like this all the time all the time so we have this feeling of in quietness but at the same time the music is beautiful it's like uh, some as I said uh, some birds flying or something like this and or the water waterfall some kind of waterfall but when we play it very light this is what makes the magic of this first part so now let's listen to the whole first part first phrase <laughs> So this is the magic and uh, I try to achieve as light touch as possible now I try to play it for you without the pedal so that we can enjoy it uh, and a little bit more clear it's not common to play it like this but just for this video so let's listen <laughs> I 
like Mozart, a little like Mozart music, but I don't think it should be played like this. Anyway, what happens next? Next comes the melody. Very nice singing melody. Excuse me. The first phrase, then the second. It's the, the beginning is the same, just the ending is different, right? Um, I love to stop a little bit uh, at the end of every this uh, two bar phrase to make it uh, to make a kind of rubato as I believe that's how singer would sing it um, especially here but then it is repeated this melody we hear because it's played uh, by the thumb but um, uh, apart from this melody we also have fast notes So all together it's like this. So it's fantastic because the, we have two accompaniments. One accompaniment in the left hand here. And another accompaniment in the right hand. So two accompaniments, can you imagine this? To one melody. It's fantastic. It's almost as if the singer has two pianos, two, two people, two pianists to accompany him or her. Absolutely gorgeous idea. Let's listen to it in a slow tempo to catch these two accompaniments. One in the left hand, one in the right hand. It means we have two backgrounds. Okay, listen. we can um, I love to um, underline the same melody in an upper voice uh, and then Chopin brings us up um, and then he um, finished the first uh, I mean the well, I would I have to call it a middle part, the middle part. So part B. He finished the part B by um, releasing this energy. Releasing this and this melody is getting sad, right? The We have the chromatic scale going down it always creates a kind of suffering feeling in our hearts so that's the suffering feeling that ends part b uh, let's listen to only the melody and the one accompaniment and then the melody with another accompaniment <coughs> just to catch it first melody and the left hand accompaniment sorry once again with the another accompaniment and then together And then we come back to part A and the part A will bring us to the middle part so the ending of part A will be different. The beginning is the same. And now from here Chopin starts. Chopin is playing with the first motif. Just you listen. He is changing the first motif only and again so build 
building, building, building the energy. The idea of the composer is that he wants to reach a huge culmination. Where is this culmination? Let's listen again. And more. And more. Here, this chord with the chromatic scale going down. This is the beginning of the long culmination. And then, and then we start part B, the favorite part of all of us, I think. So another fantastic moment of the piece. Uh, first, building up the culmination, the climax, and then celebrating this climax, because it's not a short one, it's a long one. Let's listen to this again. <laughs> everybody knows it, I don't have to explain, this is a beautiful melody. But what is very interesting is that the beginning, the left hand, I mean the part big A started with only left hand. And this is united because part B also starts. But of course you can hear we have the major key, so we don't have C sharp minor anymore, we have C sharp major, which actually is changed for D flat major, but that's not really important for, for music lovers. It's still the same key. And then the melody, the very singing, very opera-like melody about love starts. Let's analyze it. unusual for Chopin because he usually when he wrote such melodies in Nocturnos for example he should have started the second phrase um, with the same beginning so but, but he doesn't really do it uh, in such a way so listen here we have this and now we should have this Then, for example, well, it's as simple as possible, so that I, you know, I don't pretend to be a Chopin at, at all. But this should be. We have something a little different. First phrase. What Chopin is doing, he is opening the door. And this is fantastic. And then everything starts from the beginning. he ends. So it's not, it's not as simple as the surface is. This melody is constructed from, uh, of course, like always in Chopin, from shorter motifs, uh, shorter phrases. So the first phrase we can call phrase A, then we have 
phrase B which opens this door, right? And then we have again phrase A without any changes. And then we have phrase B prime, B1, which has a different ending. Let's listen again. of the tempo. We can play it slower, Chopin doesn't write anything, we can play it faster, I think it should be played in a flowing mode but definitely in the way that we can sing long phrases. So we cannot really... play it so slow because then we have to take a brief, you know. As I was saying a lot um, in other pieces of music that are singing uh, in Chopin's music, uh, we have to um, think about the singer. We have to be a singer when we play it. So we have to be smart not to choose too slow tempo, uh, because also our audience, pieces, uh, people who are listening to us, they, they are singing together with us. So... Uh, this is the same. They have to brief. The, the main um, question is where do we want to take a breath, right? So I think not here, we continue. And here we take. again right then when we have a long phrase this is much more beautiful and continue here the breath and the brief okay and this was the first part and then we have another phrase beloved high note for every singer. Every singer stops here, right? Sopranos or tenors, oh my god, they stop for, a, for a, an hour on this note. We, of course, have to stop as a pianist. We have to stop here. If there's nothing written in the score. In his music, everything is inside us. We have to understand very well that this is written for a singer. I mean, in Chopin's mind. So, even if it's not written, the left hand must wait. You, listening to me, must have the impression that I'm actually singing. But I'm singing with my fingers. So, what to do? Listen. I mean, sorry, another thing. I will now play for you the way it is written. So, literally, how it is written. I, I can't play like this even, you know? I'm making mistakes which I never make because I never play like this. It's simply so ugly. It's just ugly. Can't play like this. We need to take a time. But I hope you got the impression when I play it exactly like it's written. There is no way we can imagine somebody to sing like that. So now let's play how it should be played, how it should be sung. <laughs> Chopin's music. You know, this phrase with this long note and that opens our hearts is very short. It's only four bars. 
and after that we come to part A again except now Chopin decides to put the ending already in the first phrase already the ending so he doesn't open anymore we will never have anymore this uh, this moment when he opened uh, he opened this phrase we will never have it anymore we he will always use the second version of ending uh, this part b of the first part so let's listen let's listen to the whole middle part again Without releasing the tension, this we are waiting for this, but it will never appear because instead, this immediately we go. Chopin doesn't release this tension but he starts coda so the ending which is very virtuoso not easy to play and it's built on this short motif of four notes that we had here so this they, they come from everything from this it is a little similar uh, but upside down we can say and he is obsessively repeating these four notes and then finally 
finally, everything seems to calm down. And then this is another very interesting thing. In all the piece, left hand had accompaniment and the right hand had the kind of team. In the end, right hand gives the space to the left hand. Right hand asks the left hand, please, now you show to the world how you can sing. And at the end, my dear listeners, at the end of the piece, we again have for the last time a farewell uh, melody of the beautiful theme that we've heard in the middle part. <sighs> This is the end of course i mean i'm sure you know this piece very well and maybe most a lot of these things that i'm talking about in this video are familiar to you and they are nothing new but maybe i hope who knows i hope maybe i uh, discovered something new for you and that you find this video interesting and uh, well um, i invite you to my other videos about other chopin's uh, music um, the idea is that by the end of December or the latest, the end of January next year, 2022, there will be all Chopin's pieces published during his life, uh, um, uh, analyzed by me. So you have a lot of videos to watch if you have time and, and the patience to do this. Um, so thank you very much for watching and uh, if you play this piece, good luck. And um, well, it's it, it's a demanding piece, especially when I think to achieve this kind of light light touch. With the precision, maybe I should do another video about the how to how to practice this piece. Please let me know in the comments uh, if you think it would be useful. And if you would like to have something like this, and then I will think about it and uh, maybe prepare something like that in the future. Thanks a lot and see you again. Bye bye.